Oliver, you've been advising banks for 16 years and you've spent three years investing in them at Carlisle already. How are we going to solve this bank funding crisis in, in Europe? Or at the very least, how do you see it playing out? Well, what makes it so difficult is uh, how impossible it is to predict really what's going to happen. I think what people need to realize is that um, the scale of this thing in Europe is vastly larger than anything we were dealing with here in the United States mm -hmm. and much more complicated by virtue of the disparate states and ambitions and languages and um, objectives that every member state in the EU have. So it'll be exciting to see it play out, but I think it's got a long ways to go. So Chris Flowers, uh, JC Flowers, told us earlier that he foresees a 2000, a potentially bear case scenario, potentially playing out like it did here in 2008, where you had, you know, multiple potential bank failures. Um, is that sort of the scenario that you're working into your investment? Um, thesis and the way you're thinking about deals? Listen, I, I think it's a real possibility. Um, the liquidity crisis there is real. It's mm -hmm. been ongoing for some period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, the government response is by force uh, more complex and complicated, will be slower. And as a result, uh, in my view, you've got a very real chance that it has major implications on uh, some of the larger financial players in, in Europe. Right. So how are you, how are you and private equity in general, how, how are they thinking about how to make money off of this situation? Well, listen, we're watching and uh, we're being careful. We're trying to see where we can be helpful. Uh, there are a number of ways for banks to raise capital. Uh, the sale of assets is one of those ways and obviously a way where we think we can play an important role. Mm -hmm. uh, what kinds of assets are they? Uh, is it bank loans for the most part or is it units of these banks that are no longer core or regulators are forcing them to shed? I think it's all of the above. You'll see banks shedding assets, uh, whether they be individual, loan by loan type pools. You'll also see, also see uh, these banks look to shed their operating subsidiaries. Um, the, the, the thing that interests us is there seems to be much more supply than ultimately there will be capital to meet that supply and for us that spells opportunity. So that means that you'll get assets on the cheap, is what you're saying? You know, when you buy an asset on that day, you're the high bidder. <laughs> but uh, yes, we, we feel as if we'll be in a position to buy smartly and hopefully with a little focus, uh, turn the assets around and make them worth more over time. So there are a lot of banking executives in the United States that are saying that the new capital requirements are very restrictive. Uh, we had J Jamie Dimon yesterday saying that um, you know, it's anti-American to, to impose these regulations and restrictions. You know, can you explain to us a little bit more about whether or not you agree in, uh, with, that, with that statement and, you know, how, how do we get banks lending again? Yeah. Well, I think the, the first misconception that's out there is that banks aren't lending. Actually, banks are desperate to lend, uh, but you've got to have demand and you've got to have something you can lend to on, on a reasonable basis. And I think that's, that's where there's um, a slight misconception in the market. As it relates to the comments around the, the new regulations, it's, it's clear after we go through a crisis such as the one that we went through in LA and that is ongoing today as we're seeing in Europe, um, that regulation is going to seek to address those issues. And, um, increasing capital is clearly one of the focal points that the regulators are going to have. But I think this concept that somehow the banks that are viewed as being too big to fail and therefore have a significant advantage by virtue of the perception that ultimately they've got a backstop in the form of the U.S. government should be able to benefit from that very real subsidization for which they're not paying a penny and yet not be subject in exchange for that subsidization to some form of higher capital. So what you're saying is if the government's going to provide a backstop, then you better be able to answer to the government when it wants to 
I think if you're if you're benefiting from the subsidy that a smaller bank is not benefiting from, and remember that what that translates into for the J.P. Morgans of the world is a lower uh, cost of capital or a lower cost of goods sold. If you're benefiting from that very real subsidy, I think it's very reasonable for the government to say that in exchange for that, we're going to want you to hold more capital against those assets so that, God forbid, we never have to step in. And to be candid, I think it'd be unfair if it was anything different than that, because how do you explain that to the smaller bank? who's not in a position to benefit from that subsidy and yet has to compete on the basis of similar capital requirements. So my own view is it's very fair and reasonable and I think it uh, will come through in that form. Great. That's an, that's an excellent point and I hope that you come back to Bloomberg to talk to us about a very successful bank deal that, that, that you are in part responsible for, Bank United. So we'll, we'll hope to have you back to chat about that. Well, listen, uh, Lisa?